All right. Good morning. Good morning, good morning, good morning. Test, test, one, two. Okay. So, that's got to be you. <laughs> I'm wondering, what's all these fingers in the, <laughs> the screen? Great, great selfie, man. Love it. <laughs> Got a nice buffet going on. We've got, uh, got people rolling in. Here we go. This is going to be fun. Good morning, right. everyone out in Superland. Everybody watching remotely, appreciate you tuning in. Anybody watching the replay, appreciate you checking that out on the YouTube channel. The EFC YouTube channel. Great archive information for you guys to go back, check it out. And you're going to be my designated reader today. Yes, yes, ma'am. You, you, you get to read the verses. Okay. Do you have your Bible? Or do you need mine? Well, th these aren't the verses. I need the, I need those. Just I need you to look those up, and when I get to the screen, and I read them. You got two of them in proper. One of them is in Luke. Okay, that's fine. I didn't mark about in advance, but if you okay, here I'll get you. Proverbs, and then okay. I did, this is this has all the books of the Bible in it. Like they were missed it, so I'm gonna get five So so well, all the books. Are, so it's got the Proverbs right here. That's the Luke is going to be back here, but the order is still back. It's right there. Luke is right here. Right here. Luke, you're already in Proverbs right here. Sorry. Okay. Sorry, right, folks. We're gonna get here. We've begun. One, one sec. One sec. Just making sure we're gonna be. Everybody, good morning. Good morning, you guys. Getting a chance to dig into that buffet we got back there. So, for all you people watching remotely, you got to come for the food. It is awesome. The coffee, awesome. You guys are, you know, missing out, and we encourage you to come. I know you're watching remotely, probably because you're not even anywhere near this location, but uh, we definitely invite you to come out and check us out in person. Uh, it's a whole other experience when you get to. I mean, the smell, the taste, it's beautiful, you know. Really appreciate you guys tuning in, though, and uh, watching the replay on YouTube. So if you guys aren't watching it live and watching the replay on YouTube, we really appreciate that as well. So uh, thank you, everybody, for coming this morning. This is the EFC class, Entrepreneuring for Christ. If you haven't been here before and this is your first time, we thank you for coming. If this is a repeat visit for you, really appreciate you guys coming back. Uh, we've got a lot of great information for you today. I'm going to do my best to kind of run through it in time allotted. Uh, ultimately, there's a lot to chew on, and that uh, the pun is intended, as today's title is called, You Are What You Eat. So uh, I'm going to get into the explanation of what all that means here in just a second. So um, first off, uh, just open up real quick in prayer, and we'll get the ball rolling. So. Heavenly Father, we thank you for another day of life and life abundantly. According to the living word in John chapter 10, verse 10, 
We love you, Father. We give you all the glory, honor, and praise. We thank you for an opportunity to come together as like-minded believers and as business people. Uh, the people who are trying to pursue our individual places in the marketplace according to your standards, your will, your plans, your purposes for our life. We thank you, Father, for the information that we will receive today, and we thank you for the resources, the, the, the function to apply it in our daily lives. Father. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. All right, so you are what you eat. I know you heard that phrase before, probably in a whole different context. This has got to do with SEO, website, ranking, and a whole lot of that stuff. So we're gonna you're gonna see how this kind of rivals here as we go through it. But this is an acronym, so we'll explain what that means here. But just to give you an idea of what we're gonna go over today, we're gonna be covering what does EAT stand for, uh, why is EAT so important? Definitely helps to know that. Uh, how does Google determine what EAT is and how to apply it? Now also going to discuss what happens if you ignore EAT, and lastly, how to improve your website's EAT for SEO gains, okay? It's all, like I said, it's a mouthful, so just kind of buckle in, and uh, if you guys have some questions along the way, that's great. Um, if you can hold it to the end, it helps us get through the presentation, but um, I can definitely appreciate it if you want to ask something in the moment, so. Um, first off, what does EAT stand for? Uh, most of you, if you're not in digital marketing, SEO, that kind of stuff, you probably never heard of this acronym at all. So don't worry about it. Let me get you up to speed. EAT stands for expertise, authority or authoritativeness, and trustworthiness or trust. So that's expertise, authority, and trust. That's what EAT actually stands for, okay? The concept comes from Google Search Quality Rater Guidelines. Um, this is highlighted in the blue and line because this is actually live link. You guys download the presentation, which you can do from the website, bizforchrist.com. That's B I Z, the number four, the word Christ.com. Then you'd be able to uh, click that live link and actually go to that page. Um, and it became well known after this infamous algorithm update that Google did uh, back in 2018 called the Medic algorithm update. Uh, but the concept has been around since as early as 2014. Uh, Eat is one of Google's factors. To evaluate the overall quality of a web page, and it includes some things like if a website has old or outdated content, uh, if the content was written by unqualified authors, if, if a brand had a bad reputation, so this is where things like online reviews and you know what people are saying about your matters, uh, if it was difficult to uncover the person behind the brand, find contact information, or uncover product return or refund. So this is why if you've got an e-commerce website, you know, things like your, your refund policy matters. You know, you can vary it within terms and conditions and, you know, your privacy policy, but it's best to actually have a separate refund policy. It's really easy to find that information. Google really appreciates that. Now, what does all this stuff really work to do? Ultimately, we're helping Google do their job. What does Google do? Google wants to promote websites that they fully trust. Google wants to be the number one search engine in the world, which they are. But Google is going to give you the juice that you're looking for if you help them out by giving them what they can. So Google recognizes that each will look very differently for different websites. So you guys don't need to be worried about like, oh my God, Google has this standard. And how do I apply that standard towards everything? It doesn't work the same way for everybody for everything. Uh, so depending on the type of site, it looks a lot different. Um, expertise on a gossip, uh, excuse me, on a gossip site is much different than on a news website. And, and Google understands this, right? So uh, they also acknowledge that a person can have expertise in an area even if they don't have you know, formal training, credential, certification. You know, let's say that you on your own are a wine aficionado. Okay, you don't have any credentials for that. You don't have any certification. You know, maybe you don't even have a wine business. You might get a doctor. But you, you know, you really know your wines. Well, maybe you blog about it. You know, maybe you, you know, got out there somehow in some way, shape, or form as an authority in that. Well, Google does recognize that, and they will still, you know, apply the EAT standards accordingly. So, uh, these Google Quality Rater guidelines. What do they say about EAT? Well, specifically, this is actually quoted from the document. Some topics require less formal expertise. Many people write extremely detailed, helpful reviews of products or restaurants. Many people share tips and personal experiences on forums, blogs, et cetera. Uh, these ordinary people may be considered experts in topics where they have life experience. 
if it seems as if the person creating the content has the type and amount of life experience to make him or her an expert on the topic, we will value this everyday expertise and not penalize the person, web page, or website for not having formal education on the training of the field. And that's directly from Google's documents. So, so uh, what does the Bible say about you? I want to try to thread this into our faith a little bit here. Uh, it's real easy to get lost in the technical, you know, talk and all that. But you know, we as believers really want to kind of resonate this with our faith. So, um, relative to expertise, authoritativeness, and trust, I'm just kind of giving you a, a, a basic definition of each here. Uh, we found some Bible verses that really help kind of bring the context to life a little bit, which I've got a couple over here who's going to read those for us. Uh, first one up is expertise. Uh, let me give you the definition first, and then we'll get the verse that goes with it. So when it comes to expertise, what that really means is a measurement of knowledge or skill level. The simple website demonstrates a higher level of each, more so than other websites or pages Google finds on the internet. And the verse that we've got to go along with that is Proverbs chapter 22, verse 29. And that says, Be a man diligent in his business. He shall stand before kings. He shall not stand before me. Then. So if you guys can kind of bridge the faith and the facts, you guys will see what that was means to Google and what that should mean to you as a Christian in the marketplace. Now, even not being a Christian, if you can kind of understand the underlying principles of, of what's being talked about here, you should understand that um, being an expert really shows that you know your stuff and that you stand out in the crowd in some way, shape, or form. Okay? Authoritativeness um, breaks down to a measurement of how accurate, true, and reliable you, your brand, your business, or your website, and the content within it, compare it with other options Google finds on the internet, okay? So the verse we've got to go along with that is Luke chapter 16, verses 10 through 12, and that reads, He that is faithful in that which is least is faithful also in much, and he that is unjust in the least is unjust also in much. If therefore ye have not been faithful in the unrighteous mammon, who will commit to your trust the true riches? And if ye have not been faithful in what and which is another man's, who shall give you that which is your own? So that's what Google really means by authoritativeness or authority. Okay. Now, trustworthiness or trust, the measurement of how much credence you, your brand, your website, and the content within it has. This is the ability to be relied on as honest or truthful. So, with regards to that, we've got Proverbs chapter 12, verse 17. And what does that say for us? He that speaks truth shows forth righteousness, but a false witness deceit. So, ultimately, as Christians, you should be able to really understand that when it comes to what you're publishing, and it's veracity, it matters, okay? And this matters to Google, and you, you'll see how this kicks in a little bit more here down the road. But moving right along, our next point is why eat is important. Now, you can kind of understand that already. You should be able to understand, okay, eat, I get it. This is how Google's ranking things. It's not a sip, you know, the wheat from the chaff. But there's a little bit more to it than that. So eat helps determine whether a website and its individual pages are credible sources of information about a specific subject that provide real value for users. Now, Google understands that people make life-altering decisions based on what they read online. Therefore, a bad source of information in Google search results can have real-world consequences. Now, this happens every single day already. And you guys should you probably seen this yourself, doing you know, internet searches of any kind, you know, the good, the bad, the ugly. You know, you're really looking for the right source of information, whether it's just information, you're looking for services, you're looking for products. You know, you got to sit through all that to come up with the right end result. Now, Google wants to serve up the pages with the most value in relation to a specific search query because that's how it keeps people coming back. That's how it maintains its position as the number one search engine in the world. Okay. Now, that's why Google has all these algorithm updates they do over time. They do have actually several thousand algorithm updates every single year. They're not always major. Sometimes it's just a little tweak. They're constantly improving their algorithm to deliver better services. 
Now, put simply, Google finds another domain or page that provides a better customer experience than your own. Google will promote them instead, which means lost rankings, lost web traffic, and lost revenue for any business. So this is why you've got to stay on top of your game. When it comes to all of this stuff, you want to make sure that you're keeping an eye on the ball because if not, I guarantee you, you will lose traffic, you will lose business. Okay? And it doesn't matter what kind of business you do, you will see a loss. Now, there have been updates that cause people to take precipitous drops in business. I'm talking 75%, two thirds overnight. Dump, okay, so um, if you were in a top position and you got hit and it just happened overnight, you know, you felt that a lot more. If you've never really been at the top and never really experienced what it's like to be king of the castle and you know, king of the hill kind of a thing, then it's a little different because these updates aren't affecting you as adversely. But if you're not within the first, Couple of pages of Google it doesn't matter, you know. Uh, in the SEO community, we have a we have a joke uh, that goes, um, you know, what's the best place to hide a dead body? And the answer to that is uh, on page two of Google because nobody's ever going to find it. So, uh, what does E have to do with YMYL? So this is this is another you know acronym that I don't know if you guys have heard it too much, but YMYL actually does stand for something. Uh, Google holds some industries to a higher standard, and uses the acronym YMYL to categorize them. Now, YMYL stands for Your Money, Your Life. Now, you guys may have heard of that before, and more of you probably fall within that category than you think. We'll get to that here in just a second. But um, the industries that fall within that, uh, they basically provide products and services information that correspond to either your money or your life. And we're talking about like, your health, your wellness, um, there's some other definitions of that. And what does Google say about that? Well, Google says that we have very high page quality rating standards for YMYL pages because low quality YMYL pages could negatively impact a person's happiness, health, financial stability, or safety. Okay. Now, types of YMYL sites. So this should give you an idea of that umbrella that it covers. And you guys, so you guys in this audience, I guarantee you fall within some of these, okay? So this is where the rubber is really gonna hit the road a little bit. First off, we've got news and current events. Now, that's topics that cover areas such as international events, business, politics, science, technology, but it actually doesn't correspond to entertainment or sports. But when it comes to an SEO perspective, we say apply the standard there as well. If you had a sports site, if you had an entertainment site, doesn't matter what kind, we would say apply these standards the same way. You know, don't. Don't take it for granted just because, oh, well, we're ESPN. We just deal with sports. Why does it matter? No, it still matters. Okay. Um, next one down civics, government, and law. So, the dissemination of information that pertains to voting, government agencies, public institutions, social services, or legal advice. So, this even, this really actually even covers nonprofits. You think, oh, we're a nonprofit, we're just a community action group. It doesn't matter. But no, it matters. Okay. If you're dealing with politics, you're dealing with voting, you're trying to get people to go out and vote trying to do any of that stuff, this standard matters to you, okay? Finance, any financial advice or information regarding investments, taxes, retirement planning, loans, banking, insurance, any of that stuff, okay? Credit repair, anything like that. You gotta be abiding by the YFYL standards, okay? Uh, shopping of any kind. This is all e-commerce. This is goods and services that involve a purchase. If somebody can go to your website and buy anything, you need to be abiding by the YFYL standards. Uh, health and safety, content that dispenses information or advice on health and medical issues. So this is hospitals, pharmacies, um, if you're dealing with drugs, pharmaceuticals, um, emergency preparedness, or content that defines or discusses dangerous activity, hazmat, you know, earthquake preparedness, any of that stuff. So you got any of that going on? Why well, gotta abide by it. Uh, groups of people. This is this is where it gets a little bit more generic, but uh, content that features information or claims about people based on their ethnicity, race, nationality, religion, hello, churches, got to buy it by it, age or disability, gender, gender identity, sexual orientation, or veteran status. So even if you're dealing with military stuff, you know, if it's like, oh, well, I help uh, you know veterans find jobs, and that you know that doesn't really pertain to yes, it does. Okay, so even so, this is this is not a a fully fleshed out list. This is kind of a, you know, give you the, the larger ones, but ultimately this covers a lot, okay? A lot of stuff out there. So if you 
are dealing with any of this and your business, you know somebody else that does, you know, you really got to be operating at the wine well standard. Um, now, how does Google determine heat? Okay, this is this is where you know we kind of you know, what's the standard? What do I need to do? What do I you know, what do I gotta fix? So there's three primary components to heat at a high level. There are there, there are three, but it gets real granular real quick. Uh, according to the Google search quality evaluator guidelines, number one, the equities of the creator of the main content. Okay, so now, whoever is publishing and creating the stuff in the first place. Are you certified? Do you have a credential? Are you a doctor? Are you a lawyer? Are you any of that stuff? Um, and can prove, you know, and this can trace back, you know, very easily. The authoritativeness of the, of the creator of the main content, the main content itself, and the website. So uh, I know that kind of sounds very generic, like the website, what about, you know, well, there's a lot of little stuff that happens when it comes to SEO and to make sure the website is uh, doing what it's supposed to do do according to Google standards. So if you aren't doing those things, let's say you don't have an SSL certificate on your domain, okay? Google made SSL certificates a part of their ranking factors, you know, several years ago. So if you don't have an SSL certificate and you're selling products and services, guess what? You're crawling under YMYL and you're already missing the boat because you don't have one of the key factors in, in the algorithm which is to have an SSL certificate. Google trusts those websites. You don't have it. They don't trust you. Okay. So uh, last one here, the trustworthiness of the creator of the main content, the main content itself, and the website. So this is actual verbiage derived from the guidelines. When they say main content, you know, that actually has a broader definition. You guys can go look at that a little bit more in detail. If you go, if you download this presentation from the website, you go to the live link, click over it, and read that. That document's really long. It's about five hour read. I don't, yeah, this isn't, this isn't something you're going to do over coffee today. Um, but uh, you know, there's a lot of technical terms in there, but it is what we help use as a guideline to figure out all this stuff back. It really helps from an initiative standpoint. Um, so is EAT a ranking factor? Short answer is no, EAT itself is not a ranking factor. It's a broader concept that covers a bunch of different actual ranking factors. So um, there's a lot of different signals that help make up EAT. Um, ultimately, back in February 2019, Google released a white paper called How Google Fights Disinformation. Now, it states that the importance of EAT in its rankings, and to, to cut up on that point, EAT is actually mentioned 137 times in that document. So that should let you know that they're mentioning it that many times, it matters, right? Now, there isn't a single metric to EAT, like I just said. It basically evaluates other measurable factors in the Google algorithm. Um, that indicate quality of authors, web pages, websites, and brands. So, you know, when we talk about, you know, the three pillars of SEO and how does Google rank websites, we talk about on site, we talk about off site, we talk about technical SEO. So, technical SEO are things like do you have an SSL certificate? Do you have a site map? Can Google figure out what the structure of your website is? You know, we're talking about on sites, so we're talking about the content itself, we're talking about tags. Talking about title tags and meta descriptions, you know, all that stuff needs to be on point. And uh, the offsite stuff, that's backlinks. You know, you got to have backlinks. We talked about this in, in other presentations, um, mainly the one we did called Everything is SEO. Highly recommend you guys go to the YouTube channel and watch that if you haven't already. But ultimately, backlinks coming from bad neighborhoods do not help if they are not pointing to relevant content. And one of the easiest uh, examples I can point to is back in the day when Google first came out, people understood that, oh, backlinks, it's just no backlinks from anywhere. The more backlinks, the better off you are. Uh, that was true to a point once upon a time. So people used to build backlinks that were easy to get from websites that didn't care to websites that had no relevance to where they were coming from. An example of that would be like, uh, maybe for bringing this up in church, but uh, porn websites, adult entertainment websites. Those were basically the prime place to go to get tons and tons of backlinks going back to your website. You can get them cheap, you can maybe get them for free. And uh, if you aren't in the adult entertainment industry, a backlink coming from their point of view doesn't happen. Okay, so Google looks at these things. They look at the domain authority, they look at the ranking of that website where it's coming from, and you, it's a point of view for the right reason, it's a point to the right page, you know. So all this stuff matters, okay? You gotta do a pretty thorough a link profile to make sure that you don't have stuff coming from bad neighborhoods. You can disavow those links if you do. Again, this is all technical SEO here. Uh, but ultimately, there's a way to clean you up and make sure you're going forward on the right foot 
if you haven't already done so. So um, ignoring E. Now, what's going to happen if you just say, ah, oh, fish prime, I'm going to do whatever I want. You know, I'm, I'm getting business. I got clients. I'm making money. You know, let's just keep it trucking the way we've been doing for the last 40 years. Well, okay, you can do that. Um, but there are some bigger consequences if you don't. Now, we already talked about this before, but basically you're going to lose rankings, you're going to lose traffic, and you're going to lose revenue. You know, this will happen more so over time, but you got to understand these algorithm uptight, you know, updates that happen sometimes in big hits, and then you just get blown off the bat. Once upon a time, maybe you'd be, you know, page one, page two, page three of Google somewhere in there, we're getting traffic, we're getting business, we're making money, and then update hits, and you're gone. You're 10 pages in. People aren't finding you the way they used to, you know, maybe you get some referral business and that kind of thing, but it's not the way it used to be, okay? Now, this has happened to a bunch of businesses before. So we have done studies on this in the industry. We know that this happens, and you do not want to be the guy that wakes up the next day and literally like 75% of your business is gone, okay? So if you're already ignoring these factors, um, you probably have not experienced the benefit of abiding by them, okay? You aren't highly ranked, you aren't getting a lot of juice online, a lot of website traffic. So when you talk about the adverse effects, it doesn't calculate the same way. But um, literally, consider what would happen if you lost all like two thirds of your business and 75% of your web traffic overnight. Would you be able to pay your staff? Would you be able to afford the rent of your business and your facility? Um, would you be able to buy the supply that you need to keep your business right? Yeah, those are questions that you really need to ask yourself. So um, if you were seriously affected by uh, a couple of those updates in the past, brackets was one of them. Uh, the medic update was another one. Then you know that there's no immediate trend or hack that you can just press a button on and make things go back to the way they were. This is a path that you have to walk with a lot of things to find in order to get back to where you were, especially if you weren't finding this stuff in the first place. If you ignore the stuff from the outset, there's so much more to deal with to clean up and get you right. If you're doing some of this stuff right, and then let's say that uh, an algorithm hits and you know you're like, okay, well, what what's wrong? We do an analysis, we check out the website, we check out the content, the backlink profile, we look at it, and say, oh, okay, here are the points where you're deficient, we need to improve here, we need to improve there. It's a little easier to get you back to good. But if you've been ignoring this stuff from day one, no SSL, no site map, no, no you know, refund policy, all that kind of stuff. Dude, there's so much more work that we have to do to get you back to good that it's, it's gonna take a while. And the investment to get that done is a lot more expensive and it's gonna take more time. You know, you're looking at easily something closer to a year, maybe 18 months before you get anywhere back to where you should be. So uh, there is no silver bullet. That's the main point to take away here. There is no silver bullet to fixing this stuff. Now, what's the solution? Ultimately, there is a solution. We term it in, in, in a theory. It's called marginal gains theory or the 1% factor. You guys may have heard about this. Um, the marginal gains theory basically reads that it's a theory that small yet significant improvements can lead to monumental results. So it's otherwise known as the 1% factor as I just mentioned. And it was credited to the British cycling team success at the 2008 Olympic Games in Beijing. A guy by the name of Dave Railsford, and I've got this live link, so you can go check out his Wikipedia if you wanna learn more about him. But he had taken over as performance director for about five years before that happened in 2008. His team dominated the road and track cycling events, and they took home 60% of the gold medals available. That's just insane. I mean, that, that's beyond domination. That's just how like they call the cycling events. Now that had to do with applying the 1% gains factor. And that basically means you look at the entire landscape of everything that factors into the equation. For him, you know, they were looking at seats. They were looking at the pillows the guys were sleeping on. They were looking, seriously, they were looking at every little thing. And if it was relevant, they were applying some effort into improving that. Okay, what's the best pillow for these guys to get the best night's sleep? Okay, what's the best seat they should sit on when they're riding a bike? And they made those changes, and making all those little tweaks over time got them. So this isn't this isn't Herculean effort like one god, they still burn off, put this up, power lift, oh, get it done. No, you gotta find all these little things to tweak along the way. SEO works just like that. If we find we look at the entire landscape of what you're doing, how you're doing it, relative to your competitors, okay, everything. Oh, my reviews on my oh, uh, Yelp. I hate Yelp. I'm not going to deal with that. I'm not going to answer those. Okay, well, those are reviews that people are leaving online about your business. Your online reputation matters. You should deal with that. Okay, just because you don't want to, you don't like dealing with it, doesn't mean that you should. You should. You have to. Okay, it matters. Um, now, 
you want to see a mathematical representation of this, this graph actually is exactly what 1% gain matters. Now, this isn't a vacuum kind of a situation, but this equation, 1% gain over a year each day. Now, again, this is a vacuum. This is not real life, but 1% gain every day for a year. You'd be at, this is, you know, not turned in the actual percent, but this, if you make it percent, that's 3,778 percent better. If you ignore that, and let's say you do at least 1% works each day for a year, you'd be looking at 3% worse than when you started. So you can ignore E, you can not abide by the standards, and you're going to drift slower, slower down, 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 down. You can mine E, you can abide by the standards, you can do all the things that you're supposed to, and you can pull above. Okay. So now improving your E for SEO gains. Now this be a little mind numbing. I'm gonna try to go through it quickly, but definitely I recommend you guys get the presentation. You can see all the stuff a little slower and a little um, I guess it's your pace. So um, real quick with the future of SEO and EAT. So um, the future is likely to deliver a broader, deeper, and more robust application of EAT standards uh, to identify speakers, authors, websites, and brands. Now here's a little something I bet you guys didn't know. So last year Google patented uh, they actually read a patent called speaker identification. This is actually live linked to the patent, so you can go and look at the patent yourself. Now, that actually helps identify specific speakers via speech recognition technology. You can imagine that this is going to be useful in the future with YouTube videos, webinar recordings, the podcasts, basically every form of media that captures the voice, and that's just the tip of the iceberg. So do not rest on your loyal moral. Do not assume that this stuff isn't going to just smack you in the face like a brick wall if you don't abide by it now. This stuff matters. It's, te it's technology is catching up with you quicker than you think. Okay. Now, Google search algorithm will continue to evolve through broad core updates and micro adjustments. As I just mentioned, Google does several thousand algorithm updates every single year. They're making some right now, even as I speak. Okay. So the tips. Improving your website's eat. Um, now, this is not necessarily the perfect order. I wouldn't say this is one through whatever, but I tried to kind of put it in order of relevance. Um, first thing you would want to do is kind of audit your brand. Uh, check your website. You know, see if, if you're clear, honest, and as transparent as you can be about your brand, the people behind it. How clear is that that you're an expert in your field? And uh, what does your copy and imagery say about you? Okay, good, clear pictures. Product pictures, okay, have all that real fuzzy stuff that's pixelated that you cut out using paint, not using proper graphics software and all that, you gotta cut it, okay? Google notices that and they can tell that you've got a bad picture and another guy has a good picture, okay? So you really need to abide by that standard. Um, there's other factors in that equation, but ultimately you gotta look at your entire brand overall and every piece of the puzzle and see where that lies on the field. Auditing your existing content. Now, what does your content say about you and your organization? Unless your website is brand spanking new, uh, you probably have a fair amount of existing content, such as blogs, articles, reports, case studies, data sheets. And even if you don't have any of that stuff because you, you weren't doing that before, you should have been, and you definitely should be now. Um, you got to perform a content audit to ensure that everything you published over the years meets EAT standards, current EAT standards, and anything you do moving forward does as well. So, oh, you, you, know, you say to yourself, oh, we didn't blog before. Right. Well, that didn't help you that was definitely hurting you because i guarantee your competition is okay look at your competitors look at the big ones i guarantee you you will see they're doing a lot of stuff you aren't doing that is not helping you okay ultimately if you did some of that stuff in the past oh we got why oh 10 years ago 20 years great okay you can go back and revamp all that stuff oh i guarantee you, it does not meet uh, current standards build a framework for content creation now your content must be expertly researched expertly written include links to other pages on your website that's called interlinking when you are linking from one page of your website to another and um and other domains that validate your claims and statistics that's an outbound link that's a little site going back to another site with a media um any any you know maybe some medical journal you know something like that a government website okay so you, you want to do that Okay, you want to show that you are pointing to a higher authority on a particular, you know, there's a study you're quoting, some statistics, something like that. No problem with doing that. And you should do that. You definitely should do that. Um, moving on, hire experts as needed. Now, is this a shameless plug for SEO guys like myself? Uh, <laughs> you, you, can, 
You can say yes, you can say no. Ultimately, I know you guys are looking at this stuff, and you're like, dude, that's a lot of stuff. Right. You know, you're not going to learn this stuff tomorrow. I do not expect you guys to, like, you know, go go read a blog, watch a YouTube video, and say, ah, I'm going to, you know, my team's going to handle this. Anyway. Not going to happen. I guarantee you there's stuff that experts like myself know about this in depth, and we're going to be able to help you out. Plus, yeah, when we talk about, you know, the right way to do things, we know how to do it from the jump. We don't have to go and research it, watch, you know, 20 hours of YouTube videos to figure it out. Like, we go already. So, you're better off doing this. There's a, there's a time and cost factor, right? Like, how much is your time worth? You know, how much time are you going to have to spend trying to get up to speed where a guy like me already is so you can go do the stuff that are going to do, you know? Uh, but ultimately, you should find your opportunities to outsource to freelancers, agencies, and get the stuff uh, done by other people who are better than you at this stuff. And um, they can do it for you. Um, actually, former lead pastor of this church, Dr. John Maxwell, has a book that he wrote, Stay in Your Lane. That's a very easy concept to understand. You're an expert at what you do, stay in your lane. Mm -hmm. There's another guy who's an expert at what he does, he stands in his lane. If you need to tap into those resources, and that information, and that knowledge, and that expertise, then you do that. You know, hey, I'm sure everybody here, you know, would love to go watch a bunch of videos on you know, dentistry so you can do your own dentistry at home. But you know what I'd rather do is go pay a dentist, a guy who went to school for that, that's credential to that, and not just let him take care of it. You know, that's, that's so much easier. Um, next, promote on site. So, promoting your expertise on site, we said on site, maybe on your website. Um, that's going to build up authority and trust. This starts by promoting your team, starting with your about page or your about us page. Now, your team page is that separate. Um, you want to promote your writers, promote your researchers, promote your experts. Good example of this, and I have a live link, is Healthline and Very Well Health. They do an excellent job of doing that. Uh, if you guys want to go there, live link, go you know, get the presentation, go click those, go check those websites out to see what we're talking about there. Um, but they, they do a real good job of having bios, um, all the credentials, talk about the people, and, you know, their background. So you want to do this as much as possible. You want to just be like, you know, um, pull the curtain back. Nobody's going to know who works here kind of thing. You should, you should be on point. Um, promoting offsite. Now, promote the expertise of your brand and the people within it. Enable your team to write for your brand themselves on other websites. That's called guest posting. Okay. Um, enable them to appear on podcasts, speak at events, and encourage them to speak at conferences in your niche. That's a good thing. You kind of feel like, oh, this is my team. I don't want them to go anywhere. You want them to get out there. You want people to notice them. You want them to get their name on something that says, oh, so and so spoke here. They're an expert in this. They work at this law firm. They work at this software engineering firm. They work at this accounting firm, whatever. Ultimately, that is a good thing for you. You shouldn't be worried about, oh, somebody's going to headhunt my guy. They're going to you know, pick you apart. That's not what it's about. You need to let that happen. Okay? Um, building the right backlinks. Just mentioned that. Okay? Backlinks that come from bad neighborhoods, no point. Of you want to get the good links coming from good websites, authoritative websites, high domain authority. All that stuff is going to help you in the short and long run. Um, and if you scale up the wrong effort, it's just going to damage you. Big time. You know, you're like, oh, we're getting all these backlinks. It's, it doesn't look natural. That's another thing. Google looks at that natural building out of backlinks. You can't just go get a thousand backlinks tomorrow. Google doesn't see that as natural. The natural way that links are built over time is you get a few here and a few there, you know, and that, that looks more natural. The links should be, get, be gained organically. And Google understands that there are paid opportunities, and there's a way to understand that from a, a coding perspective. But you really want to pursue a natural link building effort. You shouldn't be like just buying a bunch of links, go to a link bar, and just, you know, go into all these uh, PDFs, private blog networks, and just buy a bunch of stuff. That's bad, bad hack. Um, get more mentions from trusted sources. So, getting mentions from trusted sources to boost your heat credentials. The more your brand name shows up in authoritative sources on the internet, the more Google sees you as an authority to be trusted. So, let's say you get an NPR interview local newspaper, something like that, that's going to give you reviews. You should definitely try to get those opportunities if you can. Uh, get more reviews and respond to them. So I mentioned to you before about Yelp and, you know, online reputation management. You know, that matters. That matters a lot. So it doesn't matter if it's a negative review, you respond to it. That's one of the, my mantras when it comes to ORM is you respond to everything, the good, the bad, and the ugly, it will help you. There's a way to do it diplomatically. Um, I'll give you a perfect example. I had a recent client that has a, a copy uh, shop and uh, a woman wrote a negative review about him adding some water to her drink. 
and uh, it was an ice drink. And she was like, oh, he got, I thought maybe he did that because uh, the cold brew was really strong and we're trying to get water down so I wasn't tweaking out or stuff like that. That was actually part of it. The other part of it, when I got his story about it, was like, well, everything is measured out. You know, the milk, the ice, everything. So perfect measurement. So based on the water, ice drink cup that she had, he held it up to her and said, look, man, you want me to add more milk or do you want to? She said, no. The only alternative, if you don't want more of the insanely caffeinated cold brew, you don't want more ice because that's going to water your drink down, you don't want any more of the milk, guess what? Doesn't really be any other option other than something like water, which is not actually going to hurt the situation, really, and it was more of a top-off. We're talking maybe a fraction of an inch. So he did top it off with premium bottled water, uh, got it topped off, bubbled off, and she was good. Now, she wrote a lot of things in a review that actually gave him room to respond a certain way, or should I say, for me to respond a certain way. Uh, but ultimately, those kinds of misunderstandings can easily be kind of fleshed out in the court of public opinion. Okay. Um, next, uh, you want to show your correct contact details. This is not name, address, phone number. You want to make sure that all your contact information is accurate across the internet and on your website. Easily found, easily identifiable stuff. You want to get a Wikipedia page if you can. Now, it's not as hard as it seems, but this is all part of, you know, this is SEO at its finest. Getting a Wikipedia page for your company will help. Um, make your website as uh, easy to access and digest as possible. This has to do with things like mobile responsiveness. This has to do with things like, are you ADA compliant? That's American Disabilities Act for all of you who do not know about that. Um, accelerated mobile pages. There's a link here. You guys can go learn more about that if you'd like. Progressive web applications. There's a link there. If you want to go check that out in more depth. Um, ultimately, your website should be um, easy for users and easy for Google bots to deal with. Okay. And then uh, lastly, we actually have actually, this is not my checklist, this is the checklist from a third party resource out of the UK. There's a little checklist that's a very simplified checklist about e optimizations. So if you guys want access to it, go here, get the presentation from the website, bizforprice.com. And click on this and it will take you to that. I actually did do the homework for you. I downloaded the PDF. That is available in the resource folder. Um, again, on thisforprice.com. So thisforprice.com. And you guys, here, I'm going to show it to you real quick so you guys don't see it. So you go to thisforprice.com. You go here to speakers. There's that option there, presentations. If you click that, that's going to take you to our Google Drive. Google Drive has every single presenter broken down by their name. And then for me, just go, go there. Click that open, you see that folder of resources. That's where you go and get the checklist. Yay! Any questions from Zoom or okay, Mark? Good presentation. Uh, when you keep saying uh, Google looks at this, Google. Uh, review that. Is there a physical person doing this, or is it a bot? Or good, they got a big room that all set in a pit. A person <laughs> goes over websites. I mean, there's so many websites, you know? right? Right. So, Google actually does do this both automatically with bots, search bots, spiders is another word we use for that. Um, the other one is that you actually have people with them. So, when I was talking about those Google search guideline standards, um. And I actually have that link to here. Um, I didn't get that document downloaded for you guys. Sorry. Like I said, it's like 100 and something pages. Um, so that Google search quality rater guidelines. So that's a that's a uh, document that Google publishes and gives to its raters. They are dispersed worldwide, and they are actual people that are hired by Google to by abiding by the standards that Google's engineers come up with to review websites manually to do all the human stuff that bots are not really good. So there is a mixture of both, and then those people provide input back to the software engineers at Google, and that's how they are constantly tweaking the equation. So it's a mixture of bot and people that are working. I see. Uh, one more quick thing. I mean, it seems a lot like Google's getting Big Brother, okay? <laughs> now, Google owns YouTube, right? Yes, they do. Well, YouTube just took Newsmax off. You can't watch Newsmax anymore on YouTube because they didn't like Newsmax telling the truth, right? And that's censorship. And you're talking, okay, remember the wine salesman yeah. that you use? 
Well, he may not have a degree. He didn't, went to, he didn't go to culinary arts school, but maybe he worked in a winery, whatever. Who, who is Google to say he's not qualified? I mean, it seems you're going to run into a gray area there. And who the heck is Google? I mean, you, who they are is because they own the company. I understand. True. But who gives them the right to say your website is not worthy? Well, okay. you are not worthy. It's it, it's you're you're getting into a mixture of YMYL standards and um, what Google has published. And I've mentioned a couple times in the presentation as uh, the latitude they give, knowing that somebody doesn't have official credentials on something, and, and they are an experience, uh, an expert by life experience. So uh, you can be a doctor and be a wine aficionado on the side publish as much information about wine as you like and Google will recognize it with authority on the subject. When it comes to stuff like facts, okay, government, religion, law, current events, all this stuff, there is what is considered to be the going narrative or the standard of truth, and that is what they're using to look at everything by. When you start getting outside of that, that's when they say you're a nut, you're a coup, we're gonna take you off the air, okay? So that is being applied. Well, thank you again, and I appreciate your time, Anton, and I hope you come back again real soon. And thank you for participating. She gives us data and info on how to keep our books straight. Hope everybody returns next week. God bless. Thanks, guys. We'll close in prayer. Heavenly Father, I just thank you for this time to be together and be energized, Lord. I pray for your wisdom in our lives, Lord. I pray for each family that's being represented here, Lord. Safe travels to anybody who's abroad. And thank you for your tender mercies in each one of our lives. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Okay. Thank Thanks you, guys. Being, guys. Appreciate it. Take care.